So we're going to get into the message this morning on Activated, the power of a praying husband. And as we've said before, Kurt was a man of prayer. I went back and forth this week, um, kind of just talking to the Lord, what do you want me to speak on this week? I don't know if I should speak on the same thing. Emily was slated to speak last week on the power of a praying wife. She never got to, um, for obvious reasons. But um, as of right now, she's planning on speaking next week. So make sure you come back for that, because she is going to be doubly ready, I tell you. It's going to be powerful. You're going to want to be here for that. But um, we're talking about the power of a praying husband. So usually among men, when the topic of prayer comes up, they either get uncomfortable or tune out. Why is that? I believe it's because we don't know the power that's in prayer. We can be led to believe that prayer is for the weak, for those who can't do anything else, so they pray. Sound familiar? On the contrary, prayer is for the strong. Prayer is for those who are confident in who they are in Christ. Did you know that Jesus, when he was on earth, didn't do anything unless his father told him to do it? John 5.19 says this, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, in the, in the original language, that's what that means. Truly, truly. The Son can do nothing of Himself unless it is something He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Even Jesus, when He was here, didn't act on His own accord. He could have. He was the Son of God. He could have done whatever He wanted. But instead, He only did the things He saw His Father doing. He was a man of prayer. You see, when we study the times in Jesus' life when he prayed, and then we see what happened right after he prayed. There are so many times, and we can go into it, but here are some, uh, some flybys. The temptation in the wilderness and overcoming the devil, Matthew 4. You can write these down for later reference. As he was healing people of sicknesses, Luke 5, 16. Jesus would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. The Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 36. He prayed so strongly and incessantly that sweat like great drops of blood was pouring down his face. Feeding the 5,000, Matthew 14, 13, talks about that he was just trying to go away by himself to pray, and then all of a sudden, here's all these people. Before walking on the water as well, Matthew 14, 23, after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray, and when it was evening, he was there alone. I want to submit to you today that the power that we see Jesus display with the miracles, the healings, the walking on water, the multiplying of the loaves and the fishes, we can't just look at that without looking at prayer. It's incomplete. So when we look at our lives and we long for the miracles, we long for the power, we long for the healings, we long to cast out devils. What happened to the disciples? Remember when they tried to cast out the devil? And Jesus said, how long am I going to put up with you, adulterous generation? And they said, well, well, why couldn't we cast it out? He said, well, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. It's because there is an element of responsibility attached to prayer and to that power that God has given us. In the book, The Power of a Praying Husband, Stormy O. Martian says this, in my survey of wives, 85% of them said the most important prayer their husband could pray is that he would become the man, the husband, the head of the home that God wanted him to be. This is the most important place for a man to begin praying. Because how many of you know, many of the problems we face today in America can be traced back to father, to the father of the family. Either an absentee father or a father just not being there emotionally. And so as a, as a man and a husband prays, to be that man, that husband, that head of the home. Does anyone know what husband means? It literally means house band. Think of a big rubber band wrapping around a house. And I also want you to get a picture of a fountain. What does a fountain do? It sprays water up and out and everywhere, right? Have you ever been, been sprayed with a sprinkler before when you were a kid? Remember running through the sprinklers? Was I the only one that did that? Maybe, maybe I'm from Texas and we didn't have that many pools, so we would just run through the sprinkler. Um, so the 
a, a husband is supposed to be a fountain. That's, that's literally another translation of that word. A fountain of life, a fountain of laughter, a fountain of love. And so as you look at that, that husband, that house band that holds the family together, literally that's what it means. Someone that's a fountain and some, someone that holds the family together. Kurt Steiner, who passed from this life to Jesus' arms during our service last Sunday, was a praying husband. He was the epitome of the man, the husband, and the head of the home that God wanted him to be. Was he perfect? No. But he had a heart to please the Lord. Let's honor his example today. One thing that set Kurt apart is he had a heart for prayer. In addition to helping with the prayer chain here at Grace Oak Church, he would frequently be found praying not only during corporate prayer times, but on other occasions during the week. I can't tell you how many times in this building and the previous building, I would be walking around and all of a sudden I would see Kurt praying. Spontaneously, he just decided, you know what, I'm just going to pray right now. And he did it. What a great example. He was a man of integrity, and as I shared in the, in the funeral service, he would, um, he would be so honest that he would be cleaning and he would find a quarter or a dime or a penny, and he would place it on my chair. And so I always knew he was cleaning because he would come and he would put the change on my chair because he wanted to go into the offering. You see, prayer and integrity go hand in hand. You can't be a praying person without integrity. And I'm going to submit that to you. And that might be a little bit of a controversial statement to make this morning. But I'm going to prove to you why. Because the secret place requires you to seek him when nobody's looking. I'm going to say that again. The secret place requires you to seek him when nobody is looking. The definition of integrity is doing the right thing even when nobody is looking. Matthew 6, 5-6 through 6 tells us this. Jesus says, when you pray... You are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, when I found Kurt praying, did he come to my office and say, Pastor Nehemiah, I'm just going to go, and I'm just going to pray, and I'm going I'm to storm heaven, I'm going to intercede for the saints, Pastor, I'm just going to go pray. Did he tell me that? No, he just did it. He just went and prayed. Right? Do you see the difference there? Yes? Okay. All right. Because here's the thing. God sees our heart when we pray. We can't hide anything from him. Amen? He's not going to say, oh, I'm so impressed by your devotion to me. <laughs> no, we just, we just pray to him because he wants that fellowship. He desires that fellowship with his creation. Point number one this morning, a praying husband fights for his family. Being a man of prayer is actually the toughest thing you can do. Most men want to be known as someone who can handle themselves in a dangerous situation, right? Boys look up to superheroes, to our military, to firefighters, to those who fight for the weak. Why should we pray? Well, we already said in a previous message this week that uh, in, in this month that Jesus commanded us to but also because to do nothing is unacceptable. John Stuart Mill was the first to say it, then John F. Kennedy used it in a speech. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And I'm so glad that Kurt wasn't just a man that was a good man and a kind man, but he was a good, kind man that did something. He didn't just say, oh, well, look at the world around us. So, oh, well, he actually did something about it, and he prayed. And he prayed prayers that are still speaking today. And there is, there is some scripture in the Bible that talks about the blood of Abel still speaking today. One of the things that I believe about Abel is that he is in heaven and he is literally saying yes and amen over prayers that we're praying today. Because it says the blood of Abel still speaks today. And so I believe that as we move forward in this church, as we move forward in our lives, that the prayers that Kurt prayed for us, the prayers that Kurt prayed for you right now, those are still happening. Those are still being fulfilled. And we need to agree with those prayers. Amen? Amen. Because those prayers are still powerful. <coughs> prayer is doing battle in the heavenly realm for those who need prayer. Who needs prayer? Who needs it, right? We all do. Our families, for one, those who cannot speak up for themselves, widows and orphans. We can all, like I said before, keep Maryland in our prayers. First Timothy 5 tells us to honor widows. And then praying for leaders and those in authority. 1 Timothy 2 verse 2 tells us for kings and all who are in authority. So that we may lead a tranquil, quiet life in all godliness and dignity. And uh, 
I briefly watched the, the speech that our president gave for the UN. If you haven't seen it, I would, I would encourage you to watch it. Whether you agree with him or not, you have to admit that he stands for something. He doesn't just cater to whoever. Um, he has convictions and he stands for what he believes in. And so the example that we see set by our leaders tells us that we need to continue to pray for them. We need to continue to pray for wisdom for our mayor, our governor, our president, those that are in authority, our representatives, our senators, because they need wisdom to help govern with, with, with wise counsel and to put forth policies that are going to be godly and not worldly. No matter who's in, in charge, we need to pray for them. A praying husband realizes how he treats his wife will affect his prayer life. Any husbands in the doghouse right now? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> First Peter 3, verse 7 says, You husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman. Show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. And what does that mean? Does that mean, oh, she's a weak woman? No, that means the, the way that we're wired is different, right? Women and men have different strengths and weaknesses, and the way that we're wired means that husbands... We're supposed to be understanding, even when it's tough, even when we don't get, we don't understand, uh, because how many of you men know we're, we are never going to understand all the way, but we are trying, amen? We are trying to understand our wives. And that is what it says, is to live with your wives in an understanding way, so that your prayers will not be hindered. And I don't know about you, but I can tell <laughs> when I try to go pray and I'm mad at my wife or... You know, if something's going on between us, I can't really get through. There's not anybody on the other line. Hello? There's a dial tone. Okay. So continue to, to keep that. Um, great advice is don't let the sun go down on your anger as a married couple. Um, if you have to have a barn stormer or a knockdown drag out, it's better to just do it. <laughs> not go to bed angry, believe it or not. Um, it helps. So the thing we have to do as men is put on your armor. We are, we are to put on the armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 tells us, and women too, not just men. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. How many of you know the devil has schemes for us? So we have to stand firm against those. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So when you're mad at your spouse or mad at whoever it may be, Realize that that's not the real fight we're to engage in as men. We are to engage in the supernatural. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish in all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And there it is again, telling us to pray at all times. One of the things that I love about being married is God gave, gave us different strengths and weaknesses so that when one is weak, the other can help the, the other one up. When one person has a strength in this area and the other person has a weakness, it balances each other out. And I think that's the beautiful thing about why God puts a man and a woman together, because we are different. We need to celebrate those differences and not get angry at each other because of that. Amen? We're different for a reason. We're different because God wants us to complement each other. It's a reflection of who he is. It's a reflection of his personality. Our differences are. But also the unity that's displayed between Christ and the church is a picture of marriage. And that unity is to be replicated in us. Talk about weight. Talk about responsibility. Our marriage is supposed to reflect Christ and the church. It's an amazing thing. One of the things that I love uh, about having the Holy Spirit and knowing that he speaks is that when we're going through a marriage conflict, um, and I can't tell you how many times, um, a 
lot. If there's a conflict going on in our marriage, all we've got to do is pray. And I guarantee you the Holy Spirit will start out like that. If, if one of us is like, well, they're wrong and they're just, they just need to change and they just need to change their attitude or change their opinion, and we pray, the Holy Spirit will always tell us who's wrong every single time. So I want to encourage you, if you don't have the Holy Spirit operating in your life, pray to receive the Holy Spirit because the Bible tells us that he wants to give good gifts to all of his children, and that includes the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you more discernment. If you haven't been have that had an experience of receiving the Holy Spirit in your life, he'll give you more discernment so that when you pray, you'll be able to see things in the Spirit and be able to see things before they happen. And so, I can't tell you how many times that I'm just mad and I'm upset and I'm like convinced that I'm right. And then I'll just pray, Holy Spirit, please just, just show her that I'm right. Show her that, you know, my way or the highway. And he'll be like, actually, it's you. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and then you got to be, be big enough to accept that, hey, I'm the one in the wrong this time, right? So, you know, and it goes both ways. You know, when you, when you pray the Holy Spirit, you got to be ready for him to tell you the truth. Amen? And so, in every single time, when we submit an issue or a problem to him, he always sorts it out. Every time. So I want to encourage the married couples in this room. That's a weapon we can use against the enemy, is literally praying to the Holy Spirit to reveal to us how do we get through this conflict that we're having right now. He always is faithful to show us. We have to be willing to listen to him. Point number two, a praying husband prays for generations to come. Acts 2, 38 and 39, Peter says this in his, his historic sermon. It says, Peter said to them, repent and be each of you baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. So he's not just talking about everybody that's alive during that Bible period, but also us today and everybody that's going to come after us. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> he's speaking into the future. One of the things you have to realize about the kingdom of heaven and the spiritual realm is it's not limited by time, okay? And that, that blows our minds because we're like, well, but, you know, it has to fit in this little box and it has to just, this is how this has to, and it's like, no. The Holy Spirit is moving across space and time. The Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. He's speaking things into existence. That are, are we lining up with Him or are we just going to put Him in a box and just limit what God can do? Because I guarantee you what God wants to do in these last days is so much greater than we've ever seen before. He's doing a new thing in these last days. And so I want to encourage you to get on board with what he's doing. How do you do that? You pray. Proverbs 13, 22 tells us that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So I encourage you as a, as a husband, as a man, as a father, don't just pray for your family. Don't just pray for everything that's happening now. Pray for, their, pray for your kids' future spouses. Pray for their children's children. Pray for everyone that's coming after us, because I guarantee you, those prayers are going to be effective. One of the things I remember calling my dad when I knew that Emily was going to be my wife, I remember calling him, and he said, thank you, Jesus, because we have been praying for a wife for you since you were this one. And I realized in that moment, prayer isn't just for right now, it's also for the future. It's also for those that are that are coming after us. And so as a, as a man, we want to leave those things for our children's children, not just monetarily, which is, which is a big deal, but also spiritually. Sometimes you go through something in life that makes you realize how selfish you really are. Can anyone relate? We have a choice in that moment. Do we allow the revelation to change our actions, or do we just keep doing the same thing over and over? And so prayer is one of those things that's a very unselfish thing to do when you're truly praying the way that God wants us to pray. So I'm going to ask us this morning, how do we stop being selfish? Because I can slip into selfishness as well. I, and I don't want anyone to say amen to that. Um, that was a joke. Okay, how do I stop being selfish? Easy. Go do something for somebody else. How do I stop feeling alone? Easy. Be a friend to somebody else. Allow other people's needs to motivate you to pray. Create a prayer list. God will begin to put different people on your heart. 
Have you ever thought, gee, I wonder why I'm up at 2.30 in the morning thinking about so-and-so? It's probably because you're supposed to pray for them, duh! Okay. You're, if you're wondering, that's why. That's why you're supposed to... Okay, that's why you were thinking of them. Okay, so hopefully you got the message by now. The Holy Spirit lays people on a heart for a reason. I don't know about you, but um, I had one of my mentors this week uh, that I, I told him about everything that's been going on this week and just asked him for, for some prayer and some advice. And can you just please, please be praying with me through this week? Um, it's just going to be interesting. And so he knew it was happening, but still... He texts me the other day, and he says, Hey, can I call you this afternoon? The Lord's really been laying you on my heart more than normal lately. I'm like, okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, we can talk. And so he calls me, and, he, and we, we proceed to talk and just kind of go through everything that's happened this week. And he's just being very encouraging and, and helpful. But and, uh, towards the end of the conversation, he said, Well, you know what? I knew I was supposed to call you because, you know, the Lord laid you on my heart, and I'm pretty boneheaded. So um, for me to call you is kind of a big deal. <laughs> And he was actually my youth pastor growing up, so I know that's partially true. Uh, but um, but God speaks to us for for a reason, and I don't know about you, but sometimes as a as a human in this fallen planet, I can be tempted to be selfish. I can be tempted to just think about myself and what's going on around my little circle, and not really think about what's going on over here, or over there, or well, well, the tornado really didn't hit my house, so you know, whatever. Good luck to them, because they got hit, you know. Or, well, I'm not really concerned about my work friends, because, I mean, I know they're going to hell, but, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's my reputation here. i got to protect my rep, you know. i got to keep this thing going. Um, sorry, that was, that was some good preaching there. Um, so, God puts people on our hearts so we can pray for them. So, I, basically the point of what I'm saying is this. If you can't be motivated to pray for yourself, then pray for others. Let that motivate you to pray. I guarantee you, Kurt, when he sat down to pray, when he kneeled down, whatever, when he, sometimes he would lay down to pray, whatever he did, he was motivated by the needs of others. And you could see that in his emails that he would send out. He was just like pouring out his heart, God, please help this person. And he would he would pray prayers in his emails. I mean, the guy was like, he, he was a man of prayer. And he was a man that put others before himself. So point number three this morning, a praying husband realizes that he is not meant to be like this world. I don't think I can remind myself that enough. I think I probably need a reminder every day that I am not supposed to be like this world. I turn on the news. I turn on Facebook. I turn on whatever it may be. I can drive past a billboard. I go in the grocery store. Wherever it may be, I can't escape this humanistic, worldly view of life. I can't escape it. But a praying husband realizes that he is not meant to be like this world. And if we remind ourselves, wait, don't copy the traditions of the people of the land. Remember what Jesus said back in the Old Testament to the Israelites? Don't copy the traditions of the people in the land that you live in, or else you're going to get judged too, like they are. That's not good. I don't want that for you. I want better for you than that. God's still saying that to us today in New Testament modern day times. Don't copy the customs and practices of the people around you. Because it's going to drag you down. What happened to Solomon? Remember what happened to Solomon? He had like 900 um, concubines, right? What happened to him? Eventually and later in life, they dragged him away from the purposes that God had for him. So when we copy the customs and the practices of this world, we are effectively saying, God, we don't trust you. God, we don't trust that you can provide the desires of our heart. We're just going to run after him real quick because... That's what we see around us, and we're just going to go after it. It says that we don't trust God, and we can't wait on him. You ever see that spoiled child that just wants what they want right now? That's like us when we say that. John 15, 19 says this. If you, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Oh, Wait, I thought we were supposed to be relevant, Pastor. I thought we were supposed to, you know, um, you know, be all things to all men. And so that's why I have this this small group where we sit around and we drink and we, you know, we cuss and we do things that the world does because, you know, Pastor, we just got to be, you know, we got to be relevant. Be real careful being relevant. Real careful. 
It's a slippery slope. Okay, We are to be the way that Jesus wants us to be. We are to be different than the world. We are to look different than the world. Now, does that mean we don't drink or we don't cuss? I don't know what that means. It means that we're different than the world. I'm not saying that, that you know, I, I, I never slip up and say a cuss word or I never drink. But what I am saying is that there has to be a difference between us and the world. If someone looks at your life and they're like, wait, you're a Christian? But you do everything that I do. You say everything that I say. You live the same way I live. You go the same place as I go to. So why would I want to follow your God again? Wait, you're living a powerless life? So why would I want that? I already have that doing what I want to do. Why would I want to live by a set of impossible rules to follow when I can just do that in the world and be just the same as I always have been? Does that make sense? Our, our faith in our, the gospel of Jesus is not going to be attractive to someone when they see that we're, we're going through the same junk they are, we're having the same bad attitude they are, and we're speaking the language of hell like they are. Ouch. Okay. All right, let me get off that soapbox. Man, what is going on this morning? Okay, maybe you're trying to fit into the world system this morning, or in general. 1 John 2.17 tells us that this world is passing away, okay? I know it doesn't look like it right now. We can be lulled into sleep by everything that's happening around us. But it says this world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm so glad God speaks truth to us. I'm so glad he didn't leave us, leave us without his word. John 17. And this is a long chapter, so get ready, buckle up. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting his eyes up to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. Everybody say, glorify your Son. Glorify your son. That the Son may glorify you. That the Son may glorify you. Isn't that awesome? He wasn't about himself. He was the Son of God, and he could have been, and he wasn't. He said, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you. The only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Oh, before the world was, Jesus existed. I have manifested him to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you. And they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but those whom you have given me. For they are yours. And all the things that are mine are yours. And yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world. And yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name. See, he's praying for other people. The name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. Unity is so important, church. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Everybody say hated. hated. Okay, that's not dislike. That's hated. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Okay, church, why are we walking around trying to be like the world? Seriously. Why are we trying to walk around and have the world like us? And have the world post things about us on Facebook? And have the world be our friend? Really? Let's just live for him. And then all of a sudden, when we really get sold out for Jesus, all of a sudden people are going to go, man, I want that. I'm tired of living this empty life. I'm tired of living this life with no power, this life that's just kind of dragging along and just kind of accepting life as it is. There's more to life than that. There's more to this life than just walking through and just existing and being a part of the world system. And it's called being a part of the kingdom of heaven. We have to introduce people to Jesus. But if we're not willing to be hated, then we're not going to do it. Because our reputation is too important.
The world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Whoa. How many of us would like to just be taken out of the world sometimes? Raise both my hands. But to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Thank you, Lord, for your word. As you sent me into the world, also I have sent them into the world. Jesus is sending us into the world, church. Just like we did yesterday with the tornado relief. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who also believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, we have to remember that apart from God, we can do nothing. Apart from Jesus telling us to do something, it's not going to be effective. Oh, it may look like it'll be effective, but it's not going to stand. It's going to be like wood, hay, and straw. When judgment day comes, it's just going to burn up. If Jesus told us to do something and we go and do it out of obedience, that's going to remain. That's the gold, that's the silver, that's the precious stones. But that's another sermon. Verse 22, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. Everybody say unity. unity. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. And that's why it's so important that we set our minds on things that are of heaven and not of this world. As a husband, as a praying man, we have to continually set our minds on heaven. The things of this world very easily will drown that out if we let it. We can't. We have to fight for our families. We have to fight for future generations. And we have to fight for those that we love. You see, Kurt Steiner was a praying husband. We see the legacy that he left. Let's let his example inspire us to be the people of prayer and people who love each other deeply. John 15, 12 through 15 says, This is my commandment, Jesus said, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I made known to you. And when we pray, guess what? He's going to whisper secrets to us. It's the coolest thing. The Passion Translation says it like this. So this is my command. Love each other deeply as much as I have loved you. For the greatest love of all is a love that sacrifices all. Kurt loved us all deeply. He loved us enough to get here before anyone else got here and pray. He loved us enough to when we announced, hey, we're going to have corporate prayer at this time. Kurt was here praying. Even if it was just him and me, we're just him. He was praying. Matthew 16, 25 tells us this. As husbands, we are to be the chief sacrificers. Not our wives. We are to be the chief sacrificers. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake We'll find it. Kurt was frequently found serving the needs of others. And I'll encourage us this morning, whether you're a husband, whether you're a wife, whether you're none of those, I want to encourage you to be a person of prayer. Prayer changes things. And as a pastor, when someone tells me, oh, that's the power of prayer, God help me if I don't correct him and say, that's the power of God. God uses prayer. Absolutely. That's the power of God. God answers prayer, but it's his power. Jesus didn't even claim power for himself. He said, everything that I do, it's just because I saw my father doing it. If Jesus, if the son of God said that, how much more should we say, Jesus, show me what to do today. 
Show me who to talk to today. Show me who to minister to and say, you know what, you're not alone. I'm here for you. I'm going to be praying for you. And I don't know about you, but I've gotten to the point in my Christian life, when someone says that, I pretty much know. They're not praying for you. No, they're not. Is that too harsh for a Sunday morning? Um, or if they say, you know, I'm praying for you. Okay, I know you're praying for me. Thank you. And maybe we're not all there yet. But I believe God wants us to get there. I believe God wants us to, um, how do you say, call each other out? Oh, but pastor, that means I'm going to have to be vulnerable. Yeah. It's called the body of Christ. It's called the church. It's called iron sharpens iron. It's called when, when you see something happening that is contrary to the word of God, and you allow it to continue, now you're a part of it too. If you're in, in a room with someone and they're gossiping about someone, they're just you know going on and on about this person, and you just allow it to continue and you don't stop it. If you are harboring hatred or resentment or bitterness in your heart against another believer or someone else, and you allow that to continue, that quenches the Holy Spirit. He's not going to be able to flow in your life. If you're angry at your spouse and you're still angry at him and you're, you haven't made up and you haven't asked for forgiveness or whatever the case may be, your prayers aren't going to be answered. So why am I saying this? We have to be people of prayer. We have to be people that value the unseen. Everything that's in front of us every day, these things, our TVs, Computers, our Apple Watches, whatever we may have. There has to come a point where we shut it off. See, I think back when Jesus walked the earth, he didn't have that. He didn't have to fight that. <laughs> he could actually go up on him by himself in a mountain and pray, and he wasn't, wasn't checking his phone every five seconds. Wait, oh, Peter just texted me. Oh, the loaves and fishes are gone. We're going to have to go buy more sands. <laughs> he didn't have that distraction. He was able to commune with the Father. So whatever that looks like for you, however you have to structure that secret place. I know some people, they have a chair. Some people, they have a closet. Some people, they have a little space in their car. And they clear off the passenger seat because they say, that's where Jesus sits. Well, that's crazy. You believe God sits there? Yeah. Yeah, actually, I do. Oh, you believe in someone that can talk, talk to you and you, you actually hear him? Yeah, actually, I do. He speaks to me all the time. He walks with me. He talks with me. And I'm standing before you today to say, I'm not a perfect prayer. In fact, I have so much room to grow in this area. And Kurt was an amazing example to me and so many others. And if anything, this week has... has really challenged me as a person. What am I really doing? Am I really living the life that I need to live? Because of the example that Kurt set. He was selfless. He just, he was about everybody else. He loved deeply. And I believe that even though we had planned to talk about the power of a praying husband, and we were thinking about, well, let's just change it. Let's, let's kind of, I believe Holy Spirit in you. We need to talk about that this morning still. So I want to encourage you this morning, no matter where you're at, there is no guilt, there is no shame, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. Wherever you're at right now, just come to him and just be honest and say, Jesus, can't hide anything from you. I don't want to hide anything from you because you see me anyway, how I really am. Let's allow this moment to cause us to propel forward as a church, to propel forward as individuals, and to realize that the time is short. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. You know, I got a little angry at God that Sunday. I gotta be honest with you. I had a moment where I said, you know, I would have appreciated a little bit of a heads up 
We all have that in our own little way. But his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And he has a purpose for each one of us. And I'm so glad that he can see the future. That he can see the end from the beginning. The, the word says he is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. Nothing happens without him knowing it and having orchestrated things around it. He's sovereign. He sees you this morning. I want to encourage you today, no matter where you're at, that God sees you. And just like we sang this morning, you are not alone. Someone has been praying for you. Kurt has been praying for you. This church has been praying for you to be here this morning and to hear the word that you need to hear. Now what are you going to do about it? Are you going to respond? Are you going to commit this morning to be a person of prayer? To fight for your family? To fight for the next generation? And to realize that we are not to be like this world. The next time you get tempted not to pray, the next time someone something whispers in your ear, don't pray, don't, no, don't raise your voice, don't pray. I want you to have some ammunition. I want you to be able to say something back. You know, when uh, the religious leaders of the day tried to silence people that were praising Jesus as he rode a donkey through the streets of Jerusalem, remember what he said? These don't praise me, the very rocks will cry out. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to let a rock beat me praising my God. I'm not going to allow a rock to outpray me. I'm not, not going to allow a rock to outworship me. Judas said worship was a waste. When Mary poured the oil on Jesus' feet, he called it waste. Worship and prayer, they go hand in hand and they're never wasted. We are to pour them out liberally, just like she poured out that expensive <coughs> perfume. Maybe some of you, you haven't connected with God in a while. Maybe you've been going through worship and, and prayer and and it's just all just going through the motions. It's all ritual. It's all just, okay, I'm going to I'm going to stand here and I'm going to sing these words. I'm just going to move my mouth. But there's nothing going on in here. All it takes is a moment for God to reach in and change something in your heart. All it takes is us to surrender to him. So let's all stand together. We're going to sing a song. No, draw me close. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. Do we have that, Wendy? Draw me close. See if it's in there. See, God wants to draw close to us. We have to draw close to him. Does the scripture tell us? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We have to take that first step to him. Wherever you're at this morning, I believe God wants to touch you. He wants to speak a word of encouragement to you. Because he's calling us all forward. Oh, yeah. 
hearts this morning to keep running the race that is set before us, God. Enduring that cross that we have to bear, that we have to take up each day to be called a Christian, to be called a follower of Jesus Christ. We are to take up our cross daily and follow you. We are to be people of prayer, people of your spirit, people of power. Oh God, we are walking in a fraction of the power we could be walking in. You said greater works than these will you do. God, I want to see you touch people. I want to see your compassion flow from our hands, Lord, from our, our lips, from our lives, from our actions, Lord. Help our compassion, Lord, to flow the way you had compassion on people, Jesus. God, I thank you for Kurt. I thank you for the example that he was to us, God, and I thank you that he is in glory praising you right now, and he's he is even, even doing work that you've prepared for him to do, even in heaven, and so we thank you, God, that you are calling us to be a people of prayer, be a people who truly are not of this world, but we are truly in unity, your presence. 